I'm absolutely bricking it today. I've got my whole team is here and I don't present in front of them. And usually I imagine you all naked and imagining my team naked, naked I probably could get sued for. So um, I'm just going <laughs> to bear with me while I get my nerves down. But um, yeah, it's been this insane journey for Matt and I building the loop. And actually we just we just hit 50,000 people on the loop, which has just been this insane roller coaster to go from me and Matt in our living rooms um, sunk our entire life savings into starting this platform and then to see it grow where it is now and um, and I just love every moment of it and I'm just it's the thing that makes me happiest and it's great to hear that whole like you know getting paid to do something you absolutely love it is my definition of happiness as well and I just I just love it so before I start, I'm, I, I saw Jess Scully, who runs Vivid Ideas Present recently. She did this awesome thing where she took a picture of the crowd um, and put it on Instagram. So I want everyone to put on their smiliest, happiest, smiliest face. Okay, right. We'll do a rehearsal. One, two, three. Smile. Okay. All right. All right. One, two, three. Smile. Perfect. There we go. Smiley face. Happy. Um, so yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm Today the, the topic is happiness and um, I'm going to come from it from the perspective of um, my journey with the loop and kind of going into that job that has completely made me happy and the highs and the lows of it and it's been a really, really tough journey in many ways and you know it is a real roller coaster ride trying to get something like the loop off the ground and you know we've made as many mistakes as we've made successes and I think for me it's been about how do you weather that kind of roller coaster ride and how do you stay happy when things are, and I've can tell you sometimes things have just been diabolical and so I want to kind of take you through a journey of what we did with the loop and, and the highs and lows and then how I've tried to stay kind of happy amongst it all. Um, but before I do, can you raise your hand if you've heard about the loop before today? Okay, that makes me happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Brilliant. Um, yeah, so it's just magic seeing so many people know about it. I mean, t this time two years ago, we would have probably seen about two hands um, in the air. So we'll start. There's um, our Twitter tag is the loop Oz, if you tweet, and Instagram it's underscore the loop underscore. Oh wait, I'm sorry, the underscore the loop. Can't spell my own brand. Crazy. Um, and you know, I've had such an amazing introduction. You guys know what the loop is, but. It's all thanks to my incredible business partner, Matt Fail, over there, wave Matt. Um, it, was actually Matt's, it was actually Matt's idea for The Loop, um, and he was the one that came to me and said, I've got this idea for this platform um, that makes it really easy for creatives to showcase their work, but also connect with opportunities. And I think when I was head of marketing at MTV, I was finding it just so frustrating to find fresh talent. Um, if you put a job on a job board like Seek, if you have an MTV logo, you get like a thousand applicants, most of which aren't relevant for the role. And, to be honest, we just couldn't go through that many applications, so we primarily worked off word of mouth. And MTV was all about finding cutting edge new talent, and when you work off word of mouth, the sort of talent pool becomes a bit stale, and I just love the idea of um, being able to go, right, I need a motion graphic designer to work on a campaign, and being able to jump on a platform like The Loop and find someone. So when Matt told me his idea, I was just kind of like, okay, let's do this. Um, and for about a couple of months, we were just like, should we do it? Should we do it? We brainstormed down the pub. And then finally, we resigned from our jobs at MTV. Everyone thought we were absolutely mad. Um, and we kind of just sunk everything we owned, which wasn't that much, by the way, <laughs> um, into making the loop a reality. Um, so for those that don't know, um, really the platform's about allowing you to showcase your work, um, connect with other creatives, and also land that amazing dream job that will make you very happy. I'm not going to read these. These are our brand values that stick firmly on our office wall. Um, but for uh, really, it's about the loop is about making creatives happy and finding them that opportunity that makes them happy. And whether that's a job, whether that's a freelance gig, whether that's a new client, whether that's a great workspace to work with great other people, 
um, and or whether it's courses to upskill so you can change your career and do that career that makes you happy. So that's what keeps me going. And that means, you know, when I'm in the office on Australia Day, which depressingly I'm going to be in, um, it's the community and it's the people that we're helping um, connect with opportunities that make me happy. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this journey and it's, it's happy and then it sometimes is quite sad. Um, so it's been quite, it's been a sort of a, a bit of a journey going, this is just a visualization of kind of when it all started. Matt actually approached me with the idea back in February 2008, um, no sorry, sometimes in 2008, and in February 2008 we uh, quit our jobs at MTV and sunk our life savings. And then it took us nine months to develop the site. So at this time, we're not being paid. Um, Matt lived off tuna. He literally started looking like a tuna, I can't tell you. Um, and we worked from home. I had an amazing patient husband who just um, helped me, support me through the kind of growth of the site. Um, nine months we developed, kind of like having a baby, to be honest. Um, and then we launched at two in the morning on the December the 1st. We've actually got video footage of the launch. I found the old, I was cleaning out my garage recently and I found a champagne bottle. I was like, what is this? And I'd written on it the night the loop launched, it was a champagne we popped. And I guess from the outsider's point of view, you know, the loop's done really well. You know, the community's grown, the revenue's grown, we're hitting 50,000 people, which just blows my mind. Um, and, you know, it's been this great, great growth journey. Now, if you can imagine everything, that line here, timeline here, that's when me and Matt are feeling normal, just normal, feeling okay. Anything above the line is when me and Matt are the happiest we've ever been. We're on absolute cloud nine. We're going to take over the world. It's just brilliant. I can't stop laughing. It's really annoying for all the staff. Um, <laughs> and anything below the line is when I'm literally crying on Matt's shoulder. And I think it's all going to be really shit. And what are we doing? And I'm tired and I haven't slept. And anyway, so this is the reality of the loop journey. <laughs> It is the most happy I've ever been in my life, and I swear to God, sometimes the most sad I've ever been in my life as well. Um, so, as I said, it all started back when we first quit our jobs, and as we were quitting our jobs, so I'm just sort of here, we had that initial high of, oh my God, we're doing this, like we're going to start something that we've always dreamed about doing, we're running our own business, isn't this brilliant? And the euphoria does kind of <laughs> fade quite quickly, especially with, at that time, the GFC or the economy just went into free fall, and... Our whole business model was dependent on job advertising and we suddenly were like, you know, what are we doing? We've just quit great jobs and we're never going to be able to get off tuna. Um, uh, but then we started thinking about it and we saw the GFC as actually a really um, great opportunity for the loop. At the time, a lot of hiring managers um, in companies, great companies who traditionally use recruitment agents were looking for more cost effective ways to hire staff. And so they were looking for a platform like The Loop where they didn't have to go through a recruiter and could go direct. And at the same time, while um, everyone was sort of laying off full-time staff, they were actually switching to freelance staff. And as our platform was very freelance heavy, it was a great way for us to put freelancers or really talented freelancers in front of opportunities. So we said, sod it, let's just keep going, let's keep building it. And, and I guess we were away. We, used, uh, we started developing the site. Um, with, uh, we used a company that had built all our MTV sites that Matt had worked really closely with for with years. And we were kind of away. We were wireframing the site. So happy. It was like, God, it was mad sitting on a bed and looking at wireframes and being so happy. I was like, I am truly a geek. <laughs> um, and, yeah, suddenly what happened is... Um, the, the development company we were using, who, who are a great bunch of guys, um, we probably negotiated them down way too hard on pricing, to be honest, because we were obviously broke. And every time they had a new client at the agency that came in, they just took, they just put the loop to the side. And probably about four and a half months into the project, we realized that the site was only 10% done. Most of it didn't work. And we realized that if we'd stayed with that development company, it would be 2015 before we actually finished the site. So. The day before my 30th birthday, we decided to part ways with the development company. Um, to their credit, they never charged us for the work, but we had to go back to absolute scratch and start everything again and start the wireframe again and start the build again. So as all entrepreneurs do, we went away for my birthday and got absolutely wasted <laughs> <laughs> and came back to Sydney on a mission. Within two weeks, we found this amazing development agency in Alexandria and kind of away we were going. And they started the whole site from scratch. Within another sort of four months, we had a site and it was ready to go. And it was just amazing being able to click things and have a prototype where you're like, this, this, this could actually work. And around the same time, uh, we were starting to present to potential clients 
And we went into Moon Communications, which is just around the corner, and we presented to this um, amazing guy called Chris Laws at Moon, and we showed him the concept of the site, and I said, you know, you want to be part of the launch, don't you? And uh, Chris kind of looked through the presentation, and he was a bit quiet. At the end of the presentation, he goes, you know what, guys, this is such a brilliant idea, but the branding is disgusting. And he was so right. At the time, we were like this Luke um, blue splats. I, one day I'll show people. It's so, <laughs> it was so creative. Um, <laughs> and it li literally looked like a surf brand, which is kind of off the fact that Matt's a surfer and I love the water. So um, Chris was like, if you launch with this brand, no one's going to sign up to this platform. And me and Matt are like crying in our, crying in our, um, we're back down at the really sad bit, by the way. Um, <laughs> So we made the decision that we were going to rebrand the platform with two weeks to go until we launched. And to Chris Laws' credit, and I will always love him for this, he um, found an incredible designer at Moon, a guy called Robbie Powell, um, who within a week turned around a whole new design and the logo and look and feel and color palette. And within another week, we had applied the skin to the entire site. It was just insane. Um, and I, I will love our developers forever for how quickly they turned around. So then we launched. and. It was so happy, it was insane. Um, suddenly people were signing up from all over the country. Within um, two weeks we had a thousand people on the site and I can't even tell you what that feeling's like to see these people that you've never known just kind of signing up. And within three weeks we had our first hire, the week after that we had um, 10 people were hired off the site and it just sort of snowballed from there and it was just this brilliant, brilliant feeling. On one side, <laughs> on the other side we were really running out of money. Um, we had. Been, yeah, it had been about a year where me and Matt hadn't been paid, um, and Matt was now really a tuner. Um, and we realized that if we wanted to survive, we were going to have to raise investment, um, which is quite frankly one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. It, it, put your hand up if you've seen Dragon's Den. Okay, it's like that, but worse. <laughs> you don't get filmed, but there's more people. I mean, we were going into these crazy pitches. Um, there was one pitch at a uh, table for 20. You walk into the room, and there's 70 investors, all men, I may add. There were only three women in the room. Um, and you have to have a five-minute pitch. They ring a bell at the end of it. And then for 15 minutes, they just rip your business model apart. It was just uh, gut-wrenching. Um, but we did it, and we managed to raise investment. Our old boss at MTV kindly came on as an investor, and so did five other incredible sort of investors and advisors, and they've really helped us get through. And with that money, we were able to keep investing in the platform, and we hired our first employee, Marie, who was just amazing, who used to work out of my living room in Bondi. She had her own set of keys, which um, sounds great, but I, I'm really bad at getting up in the morning, so every now and again she'd come in, I'd still be in bed, and I'd have to shower while she was at her desk. It was really unprofessional. Um, <laughs> so we were kind of away, and you know, it was just amazing to kind of be there and actually feel like we were building a business. It wasn't just me and Matt. We actually had this tangible... Per we had a person to look after, and we had an amazing community to look after. And then what happened is with all tech sort of we started getting some real tech blips. Um, the site was insanely buggy. It started um, slowing to a snail's pace. If any <coughs> of you were on the loop around sort of December, February 2010, I apologize. It took about, God, to up to five minutes sometimes to load a page, which is like watching your baby die, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it was really scary, and luckily, um, Matt's girlfriend is, um, does tech recruitment. She found this amazing guy called James Dean, who is an engineer, ex-engineer from Fairfax, and so he helped us like recode the whole code base so that the database actually works, and things just started flying again. And then there came this kind of decision node for me and Matt. We could either try, and we, we were starting to be profitable at this point, and we were racing to profitability, but I mean, we were still only paying what me and Matt call ourselves an allowance. Um, and we had Marie to support, and we couldn't afford to do any more sort of development of the actual platform. So we decided, you know, we could either try and grow organically, or we go out and raise investment again. So we put ourselves through the traumatic <coughs> time of raising investment. Um, and actually, the second time was a lot easier because we'd done had the experience from the time before, and um, and we found this. We met with loads and loads of investors, and we found this incredible guy called Roger Allen. Um, he owned a VC firm, but he did personal investments in um, philanthropic investments um, and arts investments. So he owns, a, has anyone heard of the convent in Melbourne, which is the art convent? So he's the main investor in that. So he really got the arts, he really got creativity, but he was also commercially savvy. So Roger came on as our main investor, and we thought, brilliant, we've done the deal, we can move on and develop the site. And then we realized that a mistake we'd made all the way back here 
just came and bit us in the ass. Um, what we had done, and this is the scary thing about starting a business because no one teaches you this stuff. We'd set the loop up as a unit trust. Um, and what this meant is that when we were raising investment, no investors would come in and raise at that sort of level um, when it was a unit trust. So we had to go through a restructure of changing the business from a unit trust to a PTY limited. Now it sounds pretty, it was the most complicated process I've ever been through and it cost us $20,000. And at that time, me and Matt are still living off tuna and we don't even know if this raise is gonna happen. Um, if anyone's thinking of starting a business, please set up a PTY limited, please, please, please. Um, <laughs> Um, but we managed to go through the restructure and we literally had all the paperwork ready for Roger to sign and then the day we, he was meant to sign, the whole um, stock market went into free fall and I don't know if you remember this, it was all the way back in August 2011, but stocks really just went vroom. And Roger called us and he went, listen, I just, I just don't know what the economy is about to do, so is it all right if we put this deal on hold? Um, which, when you've only got a very limited amount of money in your bank account and you've already found offices and hiring staff, is probably one of the scariest things you're ever going to be told. So me and Matt, I think the best thing we did at this point was we were like, just don't panic. Um, so we divided and conquered. Matt um, stayed on the phone to Roger, trying to persuade Roger to come to the table. I started investment pitching again. Um, about two days later, I'm um, pitching for investment at um, uh, the convention center and I can feel my phone just going off and off in my pocket and I'm like, Matt, so trying to get hold of me and it's either really awful news or it's really good news. And I got off the stage, called Matt, and he said that he'd spoken to Roger and Roger, um, he does gumball rallies, like racing around in these kind of crazy cars and he was, um, where was he dri driving from? He's in Tanzania driving to Cape Town. Yeah, so he's in Tanzania <laughs> driving to Cape Town. And um, Roger's assistant called Matt and said, I'm putting Roger through. And he's on the start line of this race. <laughs> Matt can hear drums, no shit, going off in the background. <laughs> and Roger's like, we've done the deal. I've signed it. It's being faxed over. And the next day, the money arrived in our bank account. And it was insane. We're so happy. We're suddenly like, we can actually now build the platform that we dreamed of and actually start kind of scaling it and taking it internationally. So... That we finally got an office. We moved into a lovely studio space just around the corner in Surrey Hills. Um, we started hiring staff. So there's now eight of us here in Sydney. All of them. <laughs> and we've also got a development team in Sri Lanka. Um, so we've basically just been building up from there. And then at this time, we also went for our first government grant application. Put your hand up if you've ever gone for a government grant. <coughs> Terrifying, right? They're like... It's just a lot of work. Me and Matt calculated it took us around 240 hours to fulfill the application. Um, and as you see, we're starting to get sad again, but the great thing is we're above that horrible, we're in the happy space still, because it's amazing finally, when we were raising investment, we didn't have a team. So when we were raising investment, we weren't working on the product. And the great thing about when this time around, when we were doing the grant application, we had this amazing team of staff who were actually still building and progressing the product, which was great. Um, at the same time, LinkedIn announced that it had hit 2 million um, users here in Australia, but at the same time, they announced their traffic numbers, and we found out that we were doing a sixth of LinkedIn's traffic, which is huge, and considering we had, there's a less, less than a sixth percent of the population are creatives, we were kind of punching way above, above our weight, so we were really in the happy space. Um, we didn't get the grant. Um, so back down, sad again. Um, but then we went on very quickly to win a, this amazing UK um, trade and investment um, competition called Go UK, which really was going to help us um, launch the platform into the UK. Um, uh, and then we had a bit of a blip uh, um, late last year where we lost our head of sales. Um, and we suddenly had no sales team and um, revenue was a little tight. So we were back down at that sad stage. But what I'm finding is that the sad stage is a, a, a kind of Go, we're going quicker back up from the sad stages than when we used to. I think we're just finding it a lot more buoyant <coughs> than we do. And now, now we've got this amazing team and this amazing office, and we're about to redo the entire site. So the new designs um, launching will be April 11th. Thank you to everyone who's been patient with the site as far. So we did an audit of the design recently. We had 97 shades of grey, as opposed to what's the book? How many shades of grey are in that? 50. So we had even more than that. Um, <laughs> um, and we're opening a London office in, um, uh, in May. So anyone who's wanting to go and work in London, you'll be able to jump on the loop and check out jobs and opportunities in London and vice versa. So um, that's exciting for us. But I guess the big thing for me is um, it really has been the most emotionally draining but also the most rewarding thing I've ever done building this platform. And we're so far away from where 
we want it to be, but we're getting there and it's been this roller coaster to get there. And I've just learned that to, to kind of actually stay with it, you've got to just persevere and you've got to stay happy. And if we're not happy, then what's the bloody point in doing it? You know, it's not about, um, it's never been about like making billions for us. It's about doing something really, really worthwhile for the creative community. And you've just got to keep happy. Otherwise you just, you, you, we wouldn't be able to get through it. So I just wanted to go through a couple of tips or things that make, keep me happy and maybe they'll relate to you too. But this is the first one which we've already sort of spoken about, but I love what I do. And I think that's so important. If you want to be happy, you're, you're, in, you're in your office for most of your life. Um, just loving what you do is the most important thing in the world to me. Someone's ringing me. There we go. Probably asking me how the presentation went. <laughs> um, so yeah, for me, if, 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 you know, it is possible to have your cake and eat it. And my baby brother's just graduated uni and he's kind of was trying to plot, you know, plot out his career. And he had this careers advisor who said to him, you know, you, you should do this because you'll make some money and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Simon, just do what your heart is. You can get paid to do what you love. And people think you can't. And you really can. I do it every day. And, uh, you know, anyone who hates what they do, just, just leave, quit, seriously. <laughs> Um, the other thing that keeps me uh, happy is we've learned that we have to celebrate the wins. I think when you're in startup land, you tend to race from one thing to the next thing because you're just trying to keep up and you're trying to just make things better. And what we've found is we weren't reflecting on all the awesome things we'd achieved. Um, so what we've done at the office now, and you can all come check it out if you ever want to come visit, but we've set up what we call a glory wall, which is a bit funny. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, so we set up this wall, um, and what we do once a month is um, we get everyone in, in the office to kind of pick out two, three things that they've achieved on that month and get a visual representation. It's not pretty, by the way, guys, but we all just get up against the wall and we talk about the things that we have achieved, and it's just a really great way of always in the office. You can look across and you can see, oh, my God, that's the stuff that we've done over the year. My favorite, obviously, is the just don't fuck it up. Um, we were really lucky to be mentored by um, the head of strategy at Google, and uh, his big piece of advice to me and Matt was just don't fuck it up. So um, <laughs> that's firmly on our wall. Um, this one is who I love. It was the first time we saw a poster when we were walking around Surrey Hills, and um, someone had just put their um, name and their link to their loop URL as a promotion. So it's kind of things like that that we just put up, and just to remember where we've come from. Another thing that really keeps me happy is learning. Um, I'm an absolute junkie when it comes to reading, or actually I listen to audio books. Um, I, uh, has anyone got an Audible account here? Yeah, Audible's amazing. It basically allows me to just download like two audio books a month. And I walk to work just listening to books that inspire me. I mean, it's terrifying kind of going from somewhere at MTV where you're quite protected to suddenly running a company. And there's so much I don't know. But you know, as long as I'm just always trying to improve myself and anything I don't know, I either find someone who does know it or I try and read something. So some brilliant books there are some of my favorites, but there's loads and loads more. Um, Blink's a really interesting one by Malcolm Gladwell. There's actually a chapter on happiness in Blink, um, which is I found really fascinating. It talks about, obviously when you're happy, you smile, but it actually apparently happens in reverse, and this really works. If you're feeling really miserable and low and sad, if you make yourself smile and you make yourself laugh, you actually trick your body into believing you're happy. And it works, it really works. So the next time you're feeling really depressed, just try and make yourself laugh, I don't know how, but um, <laughs> just smile and you'll find that your mood naturally will change. And it's just little tricks like that that can keep you happy. Um, which means whenever I'm sad, by the way, I, I laugh uncontrollably. <laughs> um, you probably can't see this very well, but the other thing that keeps me happy is our community. Um, we just get the most amazing emails from everyone if they've, they've worked on a project with someone on the loop or they've found a job on someone on the loop. And we keep every single one. We have a folder. And we have a rule in the office. If you get a lovely email from someone, you flick it on to the rest of the team, including the guys in Sri Lanka. Um, and this one's from a great designer called Stephen Layfield. And he emailed me and Matt. And um, he basically got headhunted by Apple in Cupertino um, to come and be a creative director of uh, Apple. And they flew him over there for an interview. He actually turned down the job. Um, but he just emailed me and said, you know, if it wasn't for you guys, Apple would have never put me on their radar. And, you know, it's moments like that that just make drinking so much coffee and having absolutely no life completely worth it. Um, other things that made me happy, I was really um, lucky to present alongside Stefan Zagmeister at a, present, uh, a conference in Brisbane called Creative 3. Has anyone heard of Creative 3? Oh my god, if I can recommend to anyone, 
Can you write down Creative 3 and go check it out? It's actually one of the best creative conferences I've ever been to. The reason, it's more for creative entrepreneurs, <coughs> so if you're thinking of starting a business as a creative, it will give you really practical trips on starting that business, so go check out Creative 3. But um, Stefan, it was, I didn't realize, but Stefan actually suffered from depression. Um, and off the back of his depression after his mother died, he did, um, he produced a film about happiness and he wanted to explore what made people happy. And they did a load of research on those kind of triggers that you think make people happy. So wealth, they found that mm -hmm. as long as you're over the bread line, there is no difference if you're really wealthy or if you're not so wealthy in your happiness levels or your perceived happiness levels. And these gumballs basically here, he set up this exhibition where you go and pick a gumball on how happy you think you are. Um, you can't see, but actually most people think they're around seven. <laughs> The other thing they found is that um, looks make absolutely no difference on your perception of if you're happy or not. Um, other things like size, if you're overweight or if you're underweight, none of that makes any difference. What they found is the big difference is sociability and it's the people in your life that keep you buoyant and for me that's so true. My, my friends, my family and my husband have been the most insanely supportive people. Um, my best friend Ange, when I was working from home, she used to come to my flat every night through summer and ring my doorbell and ask if I wanted to come for a swim. I'd only ever go about 10% of the time, but she'd just keep coming every night. And it's just things like that that just kind of keep me kind of happy and motivated. Another thing that keeps me happy, but it also keeps me absolutely sane, um, thank goodness for my poor staff, <laughs> is meditation. And I never thought I would be the kind of person that would get into meditation. I, you know, I've done, I did yoga, but it, I just, like, my brain is so busy. I was like, do I really want to meditate? I'd be so bored. Um, <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then a friend of mine went to this amazing guy called Tim Brown in Paddington, um, and who taught him to meditate. And he said that he, he was oversleeping at the time because he was so stressed, so he was sleeping like 10 hours a day. He then dropped down to seven because doing 20 minutes of meditation in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon just reinvigorated his brain and his productivity went through the roof. And it's amazing. I'm, I'm meant to do it twice a day. I do it once a day, but it's a really great way of just getting everything off my mind and having that just really quiet time, which means I am much more productive when I meditate. My husband actually notices when I don't meditate and sends me off to meditate because he says I'm nuts without it. Um, <laughs> um, another thing that keeps me happy is serendipity, weirdly. Um, I've just found that during this whole crazy ride, people have just come out the woodwork and helped when I've most needed it. And it's really amazing to, for that to happen. I, I really do believe that if you're on the right path in life, everything will be okay as long as you're open to suggestion. And, um, you know, it's Chris Law's rebranding the loop before we launched. Um, after we lost our sales guy, um, we did actually end up getting that grant. These things drop just when you need them, and it keeps happening, and it keeps happening. So someone, somewhere, is wanting mm -hmm. us to succeed, which is great. We've just got to kind of keep being open to it. Other things that keep me happy is the stuff that we've got coming up. So um, mobile site launching in about two weeks, and the redesign, which is launching. It was really nice to meet, where's Buzz? It's really nice to meet Buzz today, because um, if, if you guys heard of Preview, which is a way that you can feed back on designs and websites, We've been using Preview to do our whole redesign. It's the most amazing software. So if you're thinking of designing a website, use Preview. Um, that's the color palette, guys. It's kind of similar to the same one, but um, it's not as many shades of gray. Um, and then UK. So I just found an office in Shoreditch, and uh, the office will be opening in April, which should be amazing. And I find that having things to kind of, you know, tasks to look forward to and having deadlines actually keeps me motivated and happy. And I feel like when things sort of just slide and slide, I, I get more crazy. And then finally, my team makes me happy, and I'm going to make them stand up. <laughs> and they're all still sitting. Hi, oh, guys. These are my team. Katie, you can stand up. Um, they, I, I swear to God, the, the loop is like my baby, uh, probably obsessively, and I feel like um, I wouldn't be able to go to London and start the office if these guys weren't around me. And... They're the best babysitters. Actually, they're probably more like godparents of the loop. And you know what? They're doing such a good job. Uh, me being in, in Australia would just get annoying because they way ahead of me now. So it's lovely to know that the loop's in such safe hands. And uh, yeah, they're great fun as well. So thanks, guys. Happy days.
Um, were, there any were there any questions for Pip? <laughs> 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 you just shout them out. God. <laughs> Can we see the old branding? <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll do a blog post for the old branding. It actually went through about... I mean, we, ne we nearly launched the site. It used to be called People Base. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, and then we, we briefly became Sell Yourself. Which is in the world! <laughs> Which sounds like a really dodgy hooker site. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe we'll do a blog post and we'll put up all the old things. Um, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> how did you promote the loop when it first went live? Did you do lots of advertising or how did you get people to know about it? Yeah, we've never really spent a penny. Like, the only sort of advertising spend we've done was FBI Radio, which is really effective. Um, but that didn't happen until sort of, like, two years in. Um, we started trying to do Google AdWords, and it just didn't work. Um, so it's really just been word of mouth and viral. So it's been partnerships have been key. So we partnered with a number of the unis, um, partnered with events like Semi Permanent, AG Ideas, and um, uh, Creative 3 up in Brisbane. Um, and really, it's just... The, the jobs and the opportunities have fueled people signing up, so it tends to be mainly word of mouth, so someone will get a job on the loop and then they'll find out that way. So, um, yeah, it's been, we found that actual paid advertising didn't work for the loop, it's really trust with the community and that's been a great thing. <laughs> you talk about your um, income, how you kind of worked out your revenue streams? Yeah. How, sorry, how oh, just, oh. can you just kind of run through how you worked out a revenue model? To be honest, at the beginning we were just job advertising. Yeah. So um, it was free for people, which we'll always keep. Um, companies, it was free to create the profile and then job advertising. And we created kind of a business model, which was a bit like this, as all business models are. Um, and then we're sort of diversifying into, um, we launched spaces recently, um, courses, creative courses, really anything that brings new opportunities to the community. And um, even though I fought it for years, we have now got display advertising, um, which is actually really needed to try and keep food on the table. <laughs> you mentioned the positive emails, the good feedback. Yeah. Is it hard dealing with the negative feedback as well? Do you know, the weirdest thing is we tend to get really nice negative feedback. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we tend to get stuff like, um, Pip and Matt, I love the loop, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, every, every now, you know, there's always people that will give really awful feedback, but we have a rule in the office, we always say sorry. So, you know, a lot of the time the negative feedback is really grounded, you know, something's not worked or the site went down or someone couldn't apply for the job and it must be frustrating. So we work so closely with the girl who does our customer service and every time they give us negative feedback, we always get it fixed and then report back to them when it is fixed. So um, unless they don't show me the emails, which might be true as well, because then I'll be fine. <laughs> You talked a lot about your business partner and how you'd work together and really rely on each other. Yeah. Do you, would you advise against someone doing a bus launching a business on their own? Do you think it would be too hard to not have that, like someone to support you through? It? Yeah, for me, it's been like the most critical thing. It's like when Matt's happy, I'm sad, and vice versa, and we kind of buoyant each other up. And I think. Um, also, we, I think it's really important to have a business partner, but they have to have different skills than you. If you're exactly the same skills, you're just going to fight. Um, Matt's, you know, he's, he's much more tech savvy than I am. He's got sales background. I give everything away for free forever. Um, <laughs> and then I've got the marketing background and the finance background because of economics. So we don't tend to, you know, cross over too much, which means, you, you, you know, you'll always fight. We'll have the biggest raging rows, but because it's not always on each other's toes, it will stop. Um, and the other really interesting thing we found is when we were raising investment, investors are more likely to invest in co-founding teams than they are in individuals, um, just because there's less risk if things go wrong, there'll always be someone there, which is great. But yeah, no, I couldn't have done it without him. No way. Well, it was his idea as well, so I definitely could <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. What sort of initial investment do you need to look at? Like in that, I think that second lot that you're after, a key investor. What's, yeah. What sort of money are we talking? Quite a bit, yeah. but not a huge amount. <laughs> um, I can't actually say. I mean, the first round was 200, 200 grand, um, and that kept us going for like a year and a half. This last round was bigger, but not Silicon Valley kind yeah. of levels. So, um, it's a lot of investment needed to kind of build a platform like this. It's it's expensive work for us. It's all about scale now. Um, 
you know, I'll either be, you know, we'll either be alive in a year or bankrupt, who knows. <laughs> Is it um, always going to be your passion project, or do you have an exit strategy? For me, it's a passion project. I think me and Matt have decided we're probably going to fall out at some point over that. So for me, I'm very much, I want to take it, or I love this, like why would I do anything else? Um, it's just that my poor husband, he's desperate for babies, and I've already got one. It's called the loop. <laughs> <laughs> I think that takes us to time. Thank you so much, Pip. Mm -hmm.